this right here, miles of open terrain, became a rare sight for agents because rather than patrolling in land like this, all of a sudden they were processing and taking care of migrants inside facilities. And it was this change in duties, coupled with the fact that we saw a record-breaking number of migrants crossing the border that made things so difficult for agents this year. I saw hundreds of reactions when the new shepherd took off, but none was as captivating to me than that of Mike Hicks, who's joining me now. Mike, seeing the emotion on your face when that rocket went off, what were you? What was going through your mind? I saw, I saw tears rolling down <laughs> your face. All I could think of was, after all these years, we're finally back in space. Good news is we could tell you the westbound lanes are opened up. That happened at around 5.30. Eastbound lanes still closed, and there's no signs, at least at this point, that it looks like it'll open up anytime soon. Let's show you right now how things look with our TxDOT cameras. This is from our I-10 at Rubin camera. There you could see the semi-trailer that overturned, and this is what's giving crews such a hard time because it's such a difficult task to remove this. Most people dream about their wedding day. They imagine themselves walking down the aisle. In this case, the aisle is an international bridge connecting two countries. And then you just throw it in the trash. Okay. Carla, thank That's you. It. And I want people to see, I was in this COVID area for about three hours, a little bit less than that. Some of the healthcare workers that we talked to in the COVID units can spend up to 12 hours. And having that N95 on, it makes it so hard to breathe. I can't imagine what it's like to go through a whole shift wearing something like that, having to do compressions, having to do CPR. So it's just so much respect for what these people are doing. Well, when we came out here to do our live shot, we encountered a group just on the other side of the border fence of about 20 or so Central American migrants. Now I'm gonna ask my photographer to see if he can just pan over and we're gonna try to speak to one of these migrants. From what they've told me, some have been here for as many as four days or so. So, disculpe su nombre. Here's an example to give you guys a better picture of some of the counterfeit items that we're seeing in the El Paso area. Some are more obvious than others. Take a look at these Jordans. You can just tell from the Jumpman logo. This on my right is how the logo is supposed to look like. He's facing the wrong direction. That one's pretty obvious to tell. Then one of the more popular items we're seeing here in El Paso, especially due to Aaron Jones' success, is jersey. So this looks like a legitimate Color Rush Green Bay Packers jersey, but if you look closer, the details show that it's not. So. You can tell from just feeling the fabric that it doesn't feel like an NFL jersey and then some of the stitching is off. That's a way to tell. When it gets to electronics though, that's when things get a little bit more difficult. Here we have Apple products, or at least they look like Apple products. It's got the logo and it looks like the chargers, but this is fake. The key differences between El Paso County and Hudspeth County is that here in El Paso, we're a much more urban area. And across our county, you'll see fencing like this. I want to turn my camera around and show you exactly where I'm at, give you a better perspective. So as I zoom in, you can see I'm about less than a mile away from the UTEP campus. And in President Donald Trump is now chiming in on the situation on Twitter. I'm going to read this live on air a minute ago. Quote, terrible shootings in El Paso, Texas. Reports are very bad. Many killed. Working with state and local authorities and law enforcement. Spoke to governor to pledge total support of federal government. God be with you all, end quote. That just coming in from President Donald Trump. We pulled it up there. Again, this is the first time he's chimed in just a minute, minute ago, uh, but we've heard other lawmakers chiming in. Governor Greg Abbott, as you mentioned, Eric, is on his way. Uh, multiple representatives from here in El Paso saying their hearts are broken because of what's going on. We want to reiterate, though, that we don't have an exact number on fatalities just yet. We're going off of official word from El Paso police. So ABC News nationally is reporting that 18 people have been killed. That's information that we have not been able to confirm here locally. The difficulties of at-home learning are well documented in El Paso, but here just a stone's throw away in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Ciudad Juarez, there are many children who haven't had any sort of formal schooling for months. It's a daily struggle here. No tenemos drenaje, pues agua potable, hay varias necesidades que tiene esta colonia. We have a lot of needs, says Katia Lopez Luján. She says her neighborhood, a colonia named Felipe Ángeles Ampliación, has no sewage or drinking water. For perspective, the neighborhood is only a few miles west of UTEP, but life for thousands of residents on this side of the border is vastly different. Katia lives in this house with her 14-year-old son 
and eight-year-old daughter. This is where they shower, says Katya's daughter Saidi, pointing to a plastic bucket. It's been more than a year since Saidi's been in a classroom. Mis amigos. Seeing her friends is what she misses the most. At the start of the school year in August, Mexico announced all students would have to learn at home. Mexican government statistics show only 56% of households have access to the internet. Les damos la bienvenida a Aprende en Casa 3. As a result, the government started offering virtual lessons like this one on television. Yo no tengo tele. Katia explains that her TV is broken. Her family doesn't own a laptop. So her two children would have to share the one smartphone they own and take turns learning virtually. This is the living situation for the family. It's in this small room where Katia and her two children sleep. So that complicates things just in general from living in a tight space trying to learn something. But the family has spotty internet access. And that means workbooks like this one, which were given at the beginning of the year, are left here collecting dust. Se acaban los datos, se quedan los niños a, a mitad de, de trabajos. Katia tells me she's had to choose between paying for extra cell data or feeding her children. Pero pues también comen. <laughs> it means Saidi and her brother spend most of their days just hanging out at home. We don't learn, she says. We just play or sometimes walk the dogs. Even at eight years old, Saidi realizes the importance of her education. She says she won't be able to do anything when she grows up unless she studies. Her dream is to be a veterinarian. No se puede este, pasar como a el cuarto año, pues mi hija que se quede en tercero. Katia says she would prefer if her daughter could repeat third grade once her school reopens. There's nothing to gain by her going to fourth grade if she's not learning anything right now, she says. It's a reality that many families in this neighborhood are dealing with since the pandemic gripped the borderland. Ya no va a ser nada igual. Things won't be the same, Katya says, but she is thankful for one thing. Her family is healthy, and that's what keeps them going forward. Mauricio Casillas, ABC7.